Welcome to another episode of the Chill by Net podcast. This podcast is created for those who are passionate about their personal development, health, and well-being. This is a platform for you to come chill by my personal stories and weekly tips in becoming a better version of ourselves and to live a better present. But first, let's chill. My name is Jeanette. Welcome back. So in the last episode, I introduced the concept of wabi-sabi, and simply put, it's a Japanese philosophy that emphasizes beauty in what is naturally imperfect, and also celebrates, you know, the brokenness, the cracks. It suggests that when something is broken, it holds more value and uniqueness. So today, we will continue our discussion around this beautiful concept of wabi-sabi, And I will also talk more about how this concept had enlightened me and gave me a new perspective to my life. So in the past, I would define a perfect life as a life without much detours, without much drastic changes, right? I mean, the idea of, you know, sudden detours are not necessarily bad, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's often seen as not so desirable and acceptable by society, right, when it comes to our career and just life in general. So when I was a recruiter, I had to look through tons of CV every day, right? And when I look through those CVs, I usually find myself admiring people who has got that kind of perfect life. You know, the CV looks really perfect. They have steady promotions, steady salary increment. As a recruiter, I think when I see these resumes, I also subconsciously aim for that kind of perfection. And I always used to find myself asking, you know, how can I make my CV more perfect? And how can I carve out a more perfect storyline for myself? You know, so that it will be more valued, right? Like the perfect CVs I see at work. So I guess partly it's because of my perfectionist tendencies, but the other part was also because I have such visibility And because of my job and what I'm exposed to, I think subconsciously it was very easy for me to kind of constantly have this idea of how I can be perceived as a more perfect and ideal candidate. Because in my job, what I'm exposed to is that the perfect CVs are often always valued and those with cracks, those that are not so perfect, there are gaps, detours, those are usually filtered out first. So because of this environment that I was in, I think subconsciously, I also strive for that kind of perfection, right? And I don't know, to some extent, it just gave me a lot of feelings of stress and anxiety every day because I guess it's just somewhat inevitable to compare as humans. But yeah, I'm really trying to just pinpoint where my stresses stems from. And deep down, I knew it wasn't an easy thing for me because I am an adventurous soul and I value trying new things and it wasn't easy for me to stick to something. I think external voices are just a lot louder, so I don't really pay much attention to the inner voice of mine, but rather I downplay it a lot and, you know, just strive for that perfection as well. And, you know, the perfection here means no detours, no deviation from what I'm doing. So I hope that provides a bit more context to, you know, why I was obsessed with the idea of having a perfect CV, a perfect life. I think partly it was my perfectionist tendencies. But the other part of it is really, I think, my work environment also contributed to that a bit. And, you know, I come to also realize that, you know, CVs are somewhat like social media, right? Where people only put the good stuff. You seldom see vulnerabilities that is being shared, struggles. You know, you only see achievements. You only see the good things. So I guess it was really like social media in the sense where, you know, when you look at social media, you tend to compare your life to the lives that people put on social media, right? So when I was looking at those CVs, I think I also subconsciously compare my entire life to what I see on the paper. And that paper, that CV, usually only shows the good things, right? I mean, who would put their struggles and their failures on their CVs? None, right? So 
Yeah, so I was just trying to really explain where this entire stress that I put on myself comes from. I think it was partly because of the exposure I get from my job. So, you know, as I was trying to pave that perfect storyline for myself, you know, I'm not exactly sure what hit, but one day I just decided that, you know, I wanted to move out of my job. So basically, I decided to take a very bold, unconventional step of walking out from my corporate job. And I guess, you know, part of the reason was my anxiety issue, which I talked about in episode 10, the self-care episode. But I guess the other part of the reason, which I did not discuss, was also because after three years of surviving the corporate, doing human resource, I guess deep down, it just really didn't resonate with my core self. And I was just trying to face that inner voice of mine. And I felt to some extent, it was this whole pandemic situation, which had allowed me to slow down. And it kind of gave me more space and time to spend with myself, you know, to talk to myself, to ask myself if HR is really what I want. And where am I heading to with my life? So it really did allow me to pause which I probably otherwise wouldn't have, right? Because before the pandemic, you know, day in, day out, I'm just always in a rush, going through the motion, and I hardly have time to really slow down and interact that much with myself. So I think more or less, if you would ask me what was it that contributed to this move of mine, I would say partly it was because of the space that I was given you know, where I'm able to pay a lot more attention to my inner voice. And I kind of like let my inner voice grow such that it becomes louder than the external voice, which I think had ultimately gave me the courage to take this step to, you know, follow my heart. Because I knew that deep down, you know, the inner voice of mine just tells me that HR is not what I want to spend, you know, 10 years of my life doing. So that being said, you know, I really did not know what I wanted, but I knew that human resource wasn't what I wanted. So I guess you cannot know what you want to do, but, you know, you kind of know what you don't want to do. (laughs) Does that make sense? So it just really didn't align to who I wanted to become anymore. And to be honest, It wasn't always this way. You know, I used to be very interested in HR. It was one of the majors I declared, you know, as part of my university degree. So I remember during my undergraduate days, you know, I was really eager to be in the industry. You know, all my internships were in HR. And I guess what really drew me into HR was because of the human aspect of it, where it was mainly because it was a job that revolves around people and providing for employees, you know, caring about their welfare, their benefits. But, you know, as I was exposing myself into this job, you know, I just felt that after a few months of being in the industry, it just didn't resonate that much with the core self. And I only felt that after I had, you know, a few months of experience full-time in the industry. I felt that it really wasn't for me. And I was probably also really afraid to move out. I was afraid to face my inner voice. And back then, you know, looking at my 23-year-old self, I was just this little girl that was really scared, really scared about facing her inner voice. And I was just basically really afraid to move out of what didn't resonate. And now, you know, a few years later, when I look back at myself, if there was something that I could tell my 23-year-old self, I would tell her that, you know, it's okay. I would tell her that it's really okay that we change, right? And it doesn't have to be the case where once we choose and pick something, it has to be like destined for life and we can't change it anymore, right? There's no rules. Like these rules don't exist. And, you know, they are just associations and they are just rules that we create in our head, right? Based on our experiences. So If I could go back and tell myself, my 23-year-old self, I would tell her that it's really okay to change because the truth is we change every freaking day, right? Every single day we meet new people, we encounter new experiences, 
right? So it's only natural that we change. And I've learned that it's really, really, really okay to change. So maybe, you know, after a few months into the industry, I perhaps learn more about the industry as compared to before. And because I get the opportunity to learn more about the industry, I probably had more idea of whether is it something that resonated with me and was it something that I really wanted. And, you know, upon learning more about it, upon exposing myself to more aspects of the job, more aspects of the industry, I felt that it wasn't for me. So as my perspective changed, you know, it's normal for me to change as well, right? That being said, you know, it wasn't easy for me to accept this. But again, you know, Wabi Sabi, my life teacher, had made it easier for me to accept it. So according to Wabi Sabi, you know, we have learned in the last episode, it's okay to go with the flow. And it's okay to change and grow. And in fact, it's not only okay, right? It's part of human nature. It is what makes our life the way it is. So Wabi Sabi actually echo this very nature of life that nothing is permanent and we are allowed to change and evolve based on the different things we contact with every day. So Wabi Sabi really again encouraged me and helped me to find comfort in the fact that, you know, it's okay to change my mind after I realized that, you know, what I thought initially was for me wasn't for me anymore. You know, it's difficult to let go. You know, it's always difficult to let go. But if something fits in the past, it does not necessarily fit the present, right? And we all like to say, you know, change is the only constant and we all can say that, right? But it's also part of our nature to be so afraid of change, you know, And we are so, so afraid of changing with what is changing around us and what is changing within us, right? So because we change every day, it's just natural for us to kind of change as well. So when we understand this whole concept, we are also able to accept change, you know, wholeheartedly accept it and understand why people change, why we are being let go of, you know, and it will really reduce a lot of our expectations on others as well, right? The expectations for others to be perfect, the expectations for others not to change, right? And the realization of this, you know, concept and how things are allowed to change, people are allowed to change, right? Was a realization that I felt it's an important one in my journey of finding the self. Because this gave me more courage and it had allowed me to take courage to do what I probably wouldn't have in the past, right? So for me, my change was actually letting go of something that no longer resonates with my inner self. And why it's necessary? Because, you know, there is beauty in it. When we actually let go of what doesn't resonate with us, we can see more of our true self, we make space for things that resonate with us even more. It creates new space for us to try new things, you know, write new stories in our lives, which is more in line to the person we are now. So on this note, I also wanted to introduce to you the concept of escalation of commitment. So this is a psychological human bias where the longer we hold on to something, it's harder for us to release it. So for instance, you know, it's harder for me to walk out of the industry, perhaps on the three-year mark as compared to the one-year mark, right? Because of the investment that we have put in it, you know, our time, our resources. So this concept of escalation of commitment really echoes that, right? You know, the longer I commit to something, the more resources I spend on an initial investment, the harder it is for me to walk out of it and to release that. And the point of saying this is, you know, sometimes it's good to give ourselves time to see if something works for us. But once we know that it's not serving our future directions, our future goals, then I think perhaps, you know, based on this concept of escalation of commitment, it may be easier to get out of it earlier when we had spent lesser resources and our time and our energy because ultimately our resources in this life is limited, right? So it's easier to walk out of a situation 
at an earlier stage as compared to later stages. Yeah, so I quit my job before knowing what I really wanted to do for sure, right? And I think many people would advise against this, right? Including my parents, but I think for me, it was partly because I really needed that full space and that full capacity to sort out my life and think about what is it that I really, really want in life. And I do personally believe that sometimes we do need that space, that full space, and time to really think about what is it that we really want. Or rather, instead of thinking about it, it's more of like having that space to try out new things, right? To be hands-on, to really try to know what is it that works for us and what is it that doesn't work for us. And that whole process of trying new things, the whole process of experimenting new things requires space, right? It requires a lot of space, actually. And I personally believe that, you know, there's nothing wrong about, you know, needing the space to rethink about your life and to rethink your purpose and your passion. And I'm only saying this because I have been told that I am wrong. And to some extent, you know, this move of mine makes my life more imperfect, right? So basically, long story short, I really had a lot more time to, you know, think about what is it that I want in life. I spent a lot more time thinking about, you know, where am I going with my life and kind of just figure out where is it that I'm heading with life. And, you know, I'm still working it out. You know, one thing I can say for sure is, you know, I really had a lot more energy as compared to when I was stuck in a job, fighting conflicting tensions, you know, fighting feelings of unmotivatedness because there was just so much that I didn't resonate with in my previous job. Right. So in the midst of all this happening, you know, I just got really inspired to start a podcast for some reason. I think partly it was the signs that I could pick up from my daily reflections, right? I reflect a lot. And I also felt that, you know, during the lowest period of my time, you know, when I left my job, I had to battle with a lot of negative feelings, a lot of self doubts, right? So what I felt was the lowest period of my time, I saw a lot of these emotions, a lot of these um, overwhelming emotions that I could actually channel into something that speaks to me more. So it was because of the overflowing thoughts and emotions and all that I was feeling, right? I just saw different sides of me that I wouldn't have. I just saw magic happening in me that I wouldn't have ever imagined or I would ever have expected. I mean, I've never seen myself writing articles. I've never seen myself writing blog posts. But, you know, the space that was given during that period of unemployment really made it possible. I guess it was partly because of the overflowing of emotions that was inside of me and I needed a space to really channel all these things out. And that's why the idea of podcast actually came to me. Well, I would say that This idea of podcast already came to me last year, but it was only this year that I really felt that I had the motivation to really make it happen because of all that I was feeling inside of me, the unpleasant feelings, the overwhelming thoughts, emotions. I just have so much, so much that I want to share and I want to let out, right? So podcast was just, I think, a brilliant idea because I had a lot that I wanted to express in this journey. And there was a lot that I wanted to speak about and just thought that, you know, at the same time, maybe someone else could also relate and find their own comfort and, you know, valuable things that they can take away from my own lessons learned. Yeah. So that was the reason why I started this podcast creation. Okay. And then after I started this, you know, entire podcast journey, I have to say that, you know, one beginning leads to another beginning. And it's really, really another lesson I've learned, right? And as humans, we tend to think a lot about, you know, the negative things, the negative outcomes, because our minds are sometimes just wired in that way, right? But it's harder for us to foresee the opportunities that were coming to our way, right? So why I say one beginning leads to another new beginning was because As I took the step to create this podcast and, you know, move towards the direction that speaks to me more, I guess the opportunities, the people that I met along the way also tend to align to my heart more, right? 
they're also more connected to my core self. And I think it just feels really right when it happens. So for my case, you know, a compliment from my previous job, from my boss, or a salary increment just does not give me the same satisfaction when a compliment comes from a reader of my blog or an audience of my podcast that tell me that, you know, my content really helped them and really added value to them. And then, you know, um, because I started this podcast journey, as I mentioned, I met new people along the way and I think someone actually reached out to me while I was doing my podcast and he recommended me to actually sign up for this TikTok wellness initiative where I get to create content relating to mental wellness and cyber wellness for the larger community in Singapore through TikTok, through using, you know, creative ways, creative videos to do so, right? So someone recommended me to sign up for this program, right? And, you know, I did, I eventually did. On the very last day of the application window, I decided to submit my application and my motivations to join the program. And eventually I got it. And the point of saying this is, you know, not, trying to brag about this new opportunity, but more of trying to bring a point across that, you know, one beginning leads to another. And through that program, I really learned a lot, right? And I also started meeting a lot new people, which I otherwise wouldn't have. And those are really things that it's really connected to my heart and it's connected to my being. So that is when I know it really feels right I was able to learn a lot more and the key thing is learning things which are more connected to my being, right? And to some extent, we can't really try to dictate what our heart is trying to tell us because that would leave us with a lot of tension, a lot of resentment, you know, unhappiness. So, you know, if you ask me how did I know that I felt right, it was again, you know, going back to my feelings, you know, whether I feel right about it because, yeah, I really believe that our emotions won't lie. There are things that we can't really put into words, but it's only something that we will know deep down, right? Yeah, so so I think I've deviated quite a bit from the content I wanted to cover, but back to wabi-sabi, right? So this wabi-sabi concept had helped me to put a lot of things into perspective it encouraged me that it's all right to make unconventional choices which may look like a failure and it may look like an imperfection in my life, right? After all, I'm going to be getting that gap. So when we start embracing these imperfections, you know, we probably will come to also see that it actually makes our life more perfect, right? Or rather less perfect, but more beautiful in its own way. And sometimes also in a way that we haven't really come to see yet, right? And at the end of the day, you know, I have to say that I think I'm still a perfectionist at heart. But what changed, I guess, was probably the type of perfectionism. The type of perfectionism in me had changed. So, you know, just to share, based on my research, there's actually two types of perfectionism, you know. So, Perfectionism itself isn't bad. You know, based on my research, there is two types of perfectionism. You know, the first type is called the adaptive perfectionist, whereas the second type of perfectionists are called maladaptive perfectionists. So the difference between these two types of perfectionists is actually one is more able to tolerate imperfections. Adaptive perfectionists, you know, set really high standards. You know, they are really achievement-oriented. They like to be challenged, they desire growth. Whereas more adaptive perfectionists, they also set really high standards, but you know, they are more failure-oriented. When they are met with an imperfection, they are often you know, more easily anxious whenever they are met with a failure. Instead of seeing it as an opportunity, as a growth, they often feel really you know, unworthy which then easily leads them to, you know, depression, anxiety, and all that, right? So the point of introducing this is, you know, I wanted to bring a point across that being a perfectionist itself isn't bad as long as we tend towards the more healthy sides of perfectionism, where we can tolerate imperfections, you know, we can kind of see 
imperfections in our lives as an opportunity for us to grow and understand more about ourselves instead of, you know, burying ourselves in feelings of unworthiness when we meet those failures and those challenges. So yeah, this is something that I have recently learned. I think it helps to put things in the context because I am still a perfectionist at heart, but I would say that as part of this journey of finding the self, as part of this journey of you know, um, learning more about myself, I want to see ways where I can actually improve you know, who I am without changing much of my inner self. So this adaptive type of perfectionism is also in line with the concept of wabi-sabi, right? Because wabi-sabi also suggests that, you know, when we allow ourselves and others to be imperfect, you know, and to kind of see setbacks as not failures, but an opportunity for growth, right? An opportunity to form a greater identity, an opportunity to be more unique. So I guess that really links up, right, where... Wabi Sabi is actually also encouraging us to go towards the more adaptive side of perfectionism. You know, it's not telling us to be careless about our lives, right? We can strive towards being the more healthy type of perfectionism. So Wabi Sabi really did taught me a very important thing that, you know, life itself doesn't have to be perfect. Or rather, it had taught me to relook at the definition of perfection. And I've also come to see that, you know, perfection can be disguised in many ways. I've started seeing cracks as part of, you know, the equation as striving to pave that perfect life for myself. And other times, things are just not by choice as well, right? Because the truth is, life is messy and there will be so many cracks in our lives whether we choose them or not. We may lose a friend, we may lose a job right? By choice or not by choice. We may also lose ourselves. We experience struggles and hardships and sometimes these are just not in our control. There are so little things that we can control in our life and we always find ourselves asking, you know, why? Why does it have to be me, right? But hey, you know, maybe we can start seeing these cracks as opportunities, right? And I've learned that it's often these times that we think that, you know, things are not working out. It's often these times that we perceive these things to make our life more imperfect, you know, be it a failure in decision making, a detour in our relationship that makes it seem less desirable to others. It's often these mistakes, it's often these downtimes that might not necessarily be entirely bad for us. Like, yes, it's bad because it's an undesirable situation. We have lost a part of ourselves, but it may not entirely be bad. You know, that's the point because there might be some value and opportunities in that that we may not see yet, but they are there. It doesn't mean that they are not there. You know, I am on this journey myself and I've really started to see that it's usually the unconventional choices, the mistakes and, you know, the little things that are perceived as failures are what makes the overall picture probably more perfect with that extra story to tell, you know, and it's beautiful, you know, it's beautiful and don't hold too much burden about needing everything to be perfect at this instance in your life because I personally believe that At the end of it all, when we start letting our life be what it is, instead of controlling too much of what it should be, it will be a rewarding journey in itself. It will be, okay? And instead of worrying about seeking that perfection where nothing goes wrong, you know, because that's not possible, we can learn to go with the flow, we can change and we can grow, right? Because in that process of changing, in that process of detours and just making a mess out of our lives, we will find our own perfection. And that is also the greatest lesson that Wabi Sabi had taught me. Thanks for chilling in. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. You can also connect with me on Instagram at chillbynet on my website, chillbynet.com to join the conversation and assess our show notes. Have a great day and we'll chill again very soon.